to be great, be whole. Do not exaggerate or leave out any part of you. Be complete in each thing. Put all you are into the least of your acts. Just as in each lake with its lofty life, the whole moon shines. Sangharachita taught that there is some necessary and profound connection between the impulse to create and appreciate art and the practice of the Buddha's teachings. And for me, that poem somehow evokes that connection. And I'm not going to explain it, but I will read it again. Just let it wash over you. To be great, be whole. Do not exaggerate or leave out any part of you. Be complete in each thing. Put all you are into the least of your acts. Just as in each lake with its lofty life, the whole moon shines. There is some necessary connection, profound connection between the impulse to create and appreciate art and the practice of the Buddha's teachings. So this is uh, part of the introduction that Divan wrote for an edition of Sangharachita's book, The Religion of Art. And that book's got four essays in it that he wrote in the early 1950s when he was still living in India, in Kalimpong. And he's really there spelling out the significance of art for the spiritual life. There's a lot of riches in that book and they're in his very early literary style, which can be uh, an interesting journey for those not familiar with it. Unfortunately, we've got Divan's uh, introduction, which, which gives us a helpful summary of the main points that he's making. And we can understand what he's saying um, with the help of Divan. We're talking about engaging with the arts Engaging with the arts gives Buddhists the chance to develop and refine our emotional lives. The arts can lift us and lead our imaginations beyond what we know. I'll just read that again. Engaging with the arts gives Buddhists the chance to develop and refine their emotional lives. And the arts can lift us and lead our imaginations beyond what we know. So if we're familiar with the Tree Ratna system of practice, all the five great stages of the path, we'll probably recognize that there's a, a reference there to what the second great stage, emotion, positive emotion. So the first stage of that path is integration, the gathering up of energies. Positive emotion is the second. The third stage is the letting go stage, the spiritual death stage. And then comes the spiritual rebirth stage, when we're allowing something more than our previous limited selves to emerge. And then the fifth is spiritual receptivity, which in some ways is the key to all the other five stages. And somewhere, uh, Sangha actually says, in fact, it's not a stage at all. So we've got this, this sense of this framework of how the spiritual life unfolds um, and art. We're going to just have a little look at how art um, connects with that. And that system of practice is something that emerged over time through the whole Buddhist tradition. It, it's not something that Sangharachita made up. It's, uh, it's kind of how a spiritual life organically unfolds. So the first part of that quote, uh, engaging with the arts gives Buddhists the chance to develop and refine their emotional lives. So it's describing how the arts can just really engage our emotions and our energies. A painting, a poem, a piece of music, a film can speak to our heights and also to our depths. It can wake us up to aspects of ourselves that we might otherwise ignore. And in fact, that's also a way of describing integration, of course, gathering up these different aspects of ourselves. And I think the arts can show us different aspects of ourselves. We need to gather up ourselves and have our hearts engaged in terms of positive emotion so that we can open to what is more 
and our usual experience so that we can grow spiritually. And the arts can lift us and lead our imaginations beyond what we know. So we can also understand this um, in terms of those third and fourth stages of the path, the system of practice, spiritual death, letting go, spiritual rebirth. We can trundle through our whole lives in the same old groove, going round the same old round. Um, if something doesn't break in, doesn't wake us up, make us realise that there's more to life than this. And actually, in some way, in some form, all of us who are here have had some kind of experience like that. Some glimpse of vision, although it might not be visual, some kind of experience, some kind of knowing that there's more than the mundane world we're habitually familiar with, or more than our habitual way of relating to the world that makes it seem mundane. So when we practice, we gradually, we have some kind of glimpse, which might come in many, many different ways. And one of the ways it can come is through um, a profound experience in nature, with beauty, with art, as well as through suffering and many other ways as we explore when we look at that on the, on the introduction course, actually. Um, but what happens is we, we glimpse something more and we let go. We let go of that more limited vision of life to allow in a vision and an experience, a way of living in relation to something more, something bigger, something that isn't just carrying on in the same old groove. Uh, and I wanted to share an experience of my own of this that was happened when I was 15. I, when I was 15, I went and I heard for the very first time Bach, a performance of Bach's St. Matthew Passion, this extraordinary piece of choral music. Um, and something happened, something happened, and I felt different. Some, I could feel something in me had changed, and I felt the effect of it carry on for actually about two days after. I remember actually getting quite grumpy because it was quite, something was out of, something had happened and I didn't really know what it was. And it was an, definitely an experience of beauty and it was an experience of myself in a different way. And I didn't really know what it was. The world looked and felt different. And actually it was over 10 years later when I started meditating and I learned about higher states of consciousness that I realized that that's actually what had been my experience. I'd had this glimpse of an expanded, experience of an expanded consciousness something more, more than my everyday experience. Um, and it actually happened a few years ago at the Colston Hall, hearing a performance of Beethoven's Fifth Piano Concerto. That's another story, but... <laughs> so, engaging with the arts gives Buddhists the chance to develop and refine their emotional lives. The arts can lift us and lead our imaginations beyond what we know. We could have a whole week-long retreat unpacking that further, but uh, hopefully it gives a bit of a glimpse of why the arts are one of the distinctive emphases of our Three Ratna Buddhist community. Um, I wanted to add a couple more points to that, um, and I'm going to unpack these further next Saturday when I'm going to do a session exploring uh, Bante Blake, William Blake, Eternity and Time, um, yeah, I'll, I'll say more next week, but William Blake was a great influence on Sangharachita and his capacity to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildflower, to hold infinity in the palm of his hand and eternity in an hour. He knew that territory of that uh, expanded consciousness. The doors of perception were cleansed. We would see things as they are infinite. So there's a point that uh, came up again and again in Sangharachita's teaching and, and founding our order, founding our movement, which is that Buddhism, Dharma, would not really take root here in the West until it had learned to communicate in the language of Western culture. And obviously that goes for wherever in the world the Dharma goes. I'm speaking as we're here and now. Um, 
in the West. The Dharma itself isn't tied to a particular culture or place or time. It transcends space and time and it transcends all cultural trappings, in fact. But it needs to find ways to communicate through culture because the culture that we live in, um, the languages, the customs, the imagination, the imagery, that's how we live our lives. Whether we acknowledge it or not, that's going on all the time. We are culturally conditioned. And our heart minds, they have this deep old wiring that resonates through language, image, and music. And wherever the Dharma has traveled in the world, it's gradually transformed and also been communicated through the indigenous cultures that it's met. It hasn't just stayed completely. The, the heart of the Dharma is the same, but the communication of it evolves in different contexts. So in China, it drew in the culture of Confucianism, Taoism. When it went to Japan, it evolved, evolved into that sort of pared down aesthetic of Zen that we're so familiar with. And when it went to Tibet, for example, you could say it married the indigenous shamanic culture, very colorful, very ritualistic, and it became that colorful, multicolored, multi-figured Vajrayana Buddhism. And I wanted to talk about this because it's important that as Dharma Fairers, we practice the arts as well as appreciating them, both those things. We can transform ourselves through the appreciation of art, as Bhante said, and we can gradually transform the way that the Dharma is communicated uh, by developing a practice in one, or, one of the fields of the arts, which is informed by our Dharma practice. It can become an expression of our Dharma practice. In fact, that brings me back to the poem. To be great, be whole. Do not exaggerate or leave out any part of you. Be complete in each thing. Put all you are into the least of your acts, just as in each lake with its lofty life, the whole moon shines. We can use the arts, whatever speaks to us, to gather ourselves, to gather ourselves up, to wake up our creative energies and inspiration, and to refine our emotional lives so we become that whole moon with nothing exaggerated or left out. And we can also practice the arts to become able, like the moon, to reflect the light of the Dharma shining in each lake, in whatever situation we find ourselves. And over decades, maybe centuries, we can grow a new culture that is nurtured and informed by the values of the Dharma. That's part of what the possibility is when we recognize the significance of arts, imagination and culture in the Dharma life. So how do we learn to do this? Well, we can learn to do this by becoming more and more of an individual. There's a talk of Bante's on art and spirituality, which um, you'll find in what the book, What is the Sangha, uh, which is where it's titled, The Artist as True Individual. And to touch briefly on this, this process of becoming whole or integrated is an individual process. We're all different combinations of conditions, habit patterns, talents and inspirations. And when we practice, we don't all become identical clones. As we develop spiritually, we become beautifully and individually different from who we are. It's like the trees, the flowers, the bushes, the creepers, the grasses, and the mosses in the parable of the rain clouds, the Dharma rains on everybody and we turn into whatever is there in, in the seed of all the different conditions that have brought us into the life that we're living now, the flower. What wants and needs to emerge uniquely and individually from each of us emerges. And I imagine we'll hear more about that from Badra shortly. There's a taster of that territory of the arts and the Dharma seen through Bante's presentation of it. I wanted to just uh, say a little bit about the Arts Cafe and its history in Bristol. Um, it was an idea that I think started cooking in 2015. 
and we had our first arts cafe evening in February 2016 and it was conceived as a pop-up cafe in fact with a fantastic folding tea room uh, and it was a space for anyone in the Sangha who'd made anything uh, to be welcome to bring it to share and that's continued um, and we've had pots and paintings, we've had patchwork, we've had garden designs, we've had weaving, photographs, entangles, and there's always a performing element as well. At the First Arts Cafe, Armander read his poems, uh, I sang some songs, Diva had shared passion he'd been writing about, about the goddess, as did Manjavadra. Um, and that was our beginning. So that was, that was about five years ago, just over five years ago. And the arts cafes continued maybe once or twice a year. It's one of those things, it, it pops up sometimes. Um, one year, many years ago, I remember the Goodafield Festival was described as a, um, a festival of temporary and ultimate delight. <laughs> Sometime in the late 90s. And I love that sense. I love that sense of something emerging and disappearing. And the arts cafe is a bit like that. Nothing happens for quite a while and then it pops up and it flowers with the creativity of people in the Sangha. And it carried on last year when we were on Zoom. Uh, there was the Lockdown Arts Cafe on Zoom when people shared what they'd been creating during the lockdown. I think there was an Ecodharma Arts Cafe at one point. Uh, and there was one, probably this time last year, there was one that was pretty much devoted to the poetry of Sangharachita, I think. People read or sang Sangharachita's poems. Um, and as I said, we are going to have another in-person actual arts cafe on Sunday, the 28th of November, which happens to be William Blake's birthday. And Nick is curating the contributions to that. So if you'd like to bring something to share, uh, do get in touch with him. The email's on the arts page of the website. Uh, but this term, we've actually extended the whole idea of the arts cafe. So we have the Arts Cafe presents a whole series of events. And the culmination is the Arts Cafe proper on the 28th of November. Today, as I say, we're kicking off with Nick's conversation with Badra. And on the 20th of November, Bridget is going to be having a similar, but obviously entirely different conversation with Shradalichni. And I think they might offer us a workshop as well. And next Saturday, as I say, I'm going to do um, an interactive session around Bante, Blake, Eternity and Time. Uh, and that day is actually the third anniversary of uh, Sangharachita's death. So it seems a fitting way to mark that. And also we're gonna have a puja in the evening. And one other innovation for this term is something that uh, Shad Lochin and I have been talking about for quite a long time. Wouldn't it be great just to hang out together making things and have somebody read to us stories, poems, interesting bits of books. So we thought we'd give it a try. Uh, and we decided to do it on Zoom, which means that you can stay in the comfort of your own home with all your stuff. Uh, make whatever you feel like, whether it's junk modeling or crochet or art welding, I don't know, whatever you fancy. Um, and be on Zoom with everyone else. We'll say hello at the start. And um, if you can bring along something to read, something that inspires you. It doesn't have to be directly done. Uh, as I say, it could be a poem, it could be a short story, um, a chapter from something, a short chapter. Um, so we've got three sessions for that. We did have four, by the way, but we've had to, um, we had a bit of a date clash, so now we've got three. And they're all in the centre calendar. So really the main thing with the Arts Cafe is it's an invitation to bring your energy and creativity and inspiration into relationship with the Sangha. And uh, through, through these sessions, what we're hoping to do is also to share some ideas and inspiration from people who've been doing that for a long time now. So I think that's uh, all I wanted to say. So I'm gonna hand over to Nick and Badra. <laughs> 